Before we get started, make sure you subscribe to this channel and click the alert notification. Welcome to lecture number five in creating competitive intelligence series. So we've been looking at the perennial problems of the tennis match and how we can address them with uh, what we what we term the rather grandiose way the the psychotechnologist. And previous lecture we looked at a, a perennial problem called a, a fundamental challenge, which is a rhythmic rhythm. And how do we create or find the rhythm in a match? How do we do that? How do we how do we get that and how do we duplicate that on the practice call? I want to look at the second of the fundamental challenges called unapprehendable margin. Unapprehendable margin, we call that UM because I'm going to have a hard time <laughs> talking about unapprehendable margin throughout the whole of this particular lecture. So we know that, unappre we know that uh, a rhythmic rhythm is a constant threat. Um, during the match and something that tennis players don't tend to recognise at all, or anyone does. Unapprehendable margin also is, 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 a, um, is a threat. Look, this is, quite <laughs> this is quite speculative. There is definitely an unapprehendable margin in tennis, and I'm going to define that in, in, in a minute. But I also want to warn you in advance here, look, this is, this is quite, quite open-ended, this research. Right? The consequences of this uh, fundamental challenge, UM, is, is something that we're continually looking at and studying. But also how, how we respond to it, again, something very open-ended, something that we study um, at the art of winning. This is, what, this is where the innovation is. So what I am giving you here is a theory and, and, and my view. I don't want it to be taken as, right, oh look, this is, this is what happens. Okay, I might often speak, uh, that's just me, I, te I, I tend to speak as if this has already been um, uh, confirmed uh, and written in stone, but uh, bear with me on that. This is, this is that, that's, that's not the case. It, it's, it is, uh, to a degree, speculative. And that's why it's quite exciting. I mean, it really is very, very, it's, it's a fascinating area, both of them, the arrhythmic rhythm and um, um, unapprehendable margin. So the what? Okay, what's the margin part? What I'm talking about is, let's say, a typical set is 150 points. So one set equals, say, 150 points. One player um, will normally get 81. Player two. So player one gets that. Player two gets that. Um, we can see the difference here. That's that's high. Um, if we bring it down, um, 79, 71, that's more common. It can be lower than that, but I, look, I would go, I would say that this margin, the difference between the, the winning player and the losing player is eight, eight points. That's that's more common from the data from the matches that we analyze all the time. Now that margin of eight points, if you ask players after a match, they're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> if you've lost, you think it's much more, I mean, you know, players say, I've got about 25 points more than that. They're way over, right? I've got 20, you've got 25. And when, oh, on the flip side of that, so when players win, they'll say, oh, well, yeah, well, I won by, uh, 20 points more than him in the sack, but that's much more likely. So this is where we can look. That's the margin part. The unapprehendable part, uh, this is where it's speculative. So we know that players will say this, that they'll, they'll point to between 20 and 25 points after a sack, which is quite, quite a difference between it actually being eight points. The una that's one aspect of the un un unapprehendability. The second aspect of our apprehendability is that you don't experience that kind of margin in, in a match. And by, by that I mean you, don't, you can't really perceive eight point difference. Matches are much, much closer uh, when you look at the data than players think. And we do, you know, we do the tests all the time that we come off 
what was the score? And then, then, then players get wiser and they go, well, I think it was probably eight points. But again, even then, they're not, <laughs> it feels, they'll report, they'll report back that it feels like 20 point, 20, 25 point difference. But they might, but they'll know that it's eight. So the unapprehendable bit, you might know it propositionally, you might know it because you've listened to me or Stur Stur Sterling and I have been involved in our winning programme, but you will never feel that or know that in a kind of embedded way um, on the tennis court. So we can see that the, that's why I call it unapprehendable. This margin can't really be experienced. So this match is always, it, it's closer than we think with that eight point margin. Matches appear to be won with reducing error, but not producing winners. So most of that eight point difference will be that the losing player would have made more errors. So you'll see that when, when, you, when, when we do the data um, analytics. There'll be slightly more errors made by one player than the other. The winners don't seem to have any impact on the on on the result from a data point of view, obviously then there's the question of, well, psychologically, they um, haven't, have at least have an effect on the outcome. And I agree with that. I would say, yes, they do. So the, the, the question posed to me then when, we, when I start working with, uh, with players and coaches is, well, why is it that we don't focus on error reduction and we're so drawn to winners and I'd say we're drawn to um, winner production in a very same way as that we're drawn towards rhythm um, in the match. What we want, drama. We want the dramatic, okay? Tennis, when, it's, when, look, when, when you're experiencing tennis, if, when, you, when you watch on the, on the TV, quite understandably, well, what are they playing back? They're playing back the dramatic. They're going to play back the rallies. They're going to play back the rhythm, the rhythm stuff. Because we're, you know, very, we're very addicted to um, rhythm, as I was saying in the, in, in the previous lecture. We love it. It's much more dramatic. That's what we kind of think. We kind of think that's what tennis is about. Drama, drama, drama. You can see the way players describe it. Right? They'll come off and they'll, 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 come off and they'll go... Um, they think that the, the outcome of the match was determined by winners and how many their opponent hit. He hit more winners, I was allowing him, I was allowing him, I was affording him the opportunity of hitting winners in the match. And you know that 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 was the problem. I'm not consistent enough. Again, we come back to this, this problem. Look, here we go. Let's bring up principle number 10, very important principle. That was the old uh, number 10. So perception is distorted by the emotional response to a situation based on current belief. What does that mean? Here's another way of looking at it. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going these cognitive terms that you, uh, you know, confirmation bias. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll tend to find things that, or we perceive things and look for things and find things based on what we actually believe. So if we believe our, our players, uh, the opponent's better than us, um, we're going to have an emotional reaction to that, but also um, we're going to find instances of them being better than us or to the exclusion of us being better than them. Very important point. So we're, 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 the, the, this state and the dramatic state, it, it distorts, it distorts in a number of, it, in a number of ways. And you can see um, on that, why, why this margin in a match, actually what determines it being very small and quite subtle, is so unapprehendable because we're constantly in this state of drama and our perception is distorted by our emotional response. We're, we're selecting from the environments this cognitive dissonance happening and there is confirmation bias. It's all around us. And based on this belief that tennis is about winners, it's about spectacular. You know, players will come off and they'll go, oh my God, they'll come off the court after the match and they'll say, oh, it's, I've got to get better at these long rallies. And you know, you can, you can try this with yourself. You don't remember missed returns in a match, you just don't. Which is a shame, this is why it's a perennial problem on that perennial margin, because that is where we need to fix problems. We need to fix the, R, the, the, the movement between R and R1, S and S1. That's where the problem is, but it's not very dramatic. 
It's certainly not we, what we believe a tennis match should be about. We, sh we you know, it should be about the dramatic, the longer rallies, the great contest. Oh, you know, like I, I'm playing my opponent, and he, he or she was like, well, we were so close. If I don't just, you know, I remember that rally that long. I need more of those. I need to be more consistent. Again, that distorts our perception of what happens in the match. You ask the player how many long rallies were there in that match. No, they really see it as far more than there actually were. Much more than the the, the ten percent. In fact, they'll probably they'll probably tell them they said they probably think seventy percent of the of the match, seventy or fifty percent of the match was uh, nine plus, and ten twenty percent was. Um, within the first strike, well, we noticed that is not the case. Another, another interesting thing about the uh, nine plus rallies is that they, they tend to be equally shared. That's not necessarily a speculative point. So, when, you, when we're looking at what happened in the extended rallies of the match, afterwards, when we're adding up what happens, they're, they're, <laughs> it's almost 50 50. They, <laughs> they don't really contribute significant, not significantly to an apprehendable margin, but that's where our our brain can be. Let's have a quick look at this in action. An experiment we, we won, we call it the Travis experiment. Just named it after me. I've done this one consistently. What is it? So we'll get a player to score. So if they're playing a point against an opponent, they will get, um, the, the, the player will call out a score for their own shot, okay? That is somewhere between one and ten, so the player will strike the serve, or um, S, S1, S2, so we've got this going down here, three if it goes that far. So then we've got, so the player and then the coach. Um, so the player will score five, might give themselves a seven, two, or a six. What we notice is, when the players do something, we compare it to the coach who's noting down what the player says when they play each shot, and then what what the coach thinks was the, 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 the shot was. So you'll notice, or we notice, that it goes something like that fairly consistently. That's what happens. So look, that is a significant enough difference between what the player says and the coach says for us to say that on average the coach will do two points higher, two plus for the coach. Then we run the same experiment with the player calling out their opponent's shots. Coach is doing the same. So here the player might go eight, seven, seven, nine. The 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 coach, by contrast, will go six, five, five, seven. There's there are small variations in this fluctuation, but generally speaking, the the, the coach will discuss. They will will note it as two less than the player does. So look, look at this, here we go, here we've got um, a problem in action, that's a four point difference between the way we perceive ourselves and our opponent. So that's perception is distorted by their emotional response to a situation based on current beliefs. Obviously our current belief is that the player's shot that they're playing, which is a current belief, is worth that. When the coach is doing that, I mean, obviously there's no real objective value of what a shot is worth, but it gives you an indication of where, um, where the perception gap is um, between one who's in the situation, the player, and the coach who's in it objectively slightly more ob uh, observing. So error reduction, not winner production, is what we're trying to, to get the, the player to do because this leads them into parasitic processing, right? This whole, my opponent's better than me, what do I do? Oh my God, it's all going on. They're just gonna hit more winners. I gotta respond with more winners of my own. So error reduction is what we're after. Let's do it in green. Here we go. We need part of our competitive intelligence. Winners do not win. If we're not about ending the point, we're gonna need patience and we're gonna need a lot of it. We are gonna cultivate patience over time. If we're in a patient frame of mind and we're doing that, we're looking at how we construct uh, the point with a good storyboard of play. What we're doing is we are strong framing the problem, not weak framing the problem. Or all the time I get, and look, please listen to me here, the, it's my backhand, it's my forehand. 
my opponent's better than me, they're always better than me, they're uh, X, Y, Z. Very weak formulation of a problem. We want the story of all the play. If we're in our reduction, we're in strong formulation. Patience is, requires um, strong problem framing. And I'll even draw a square there for you. That's what we want. I want to know from my storyboard of play what's happening. So if we remember, how do we approach unapprehendable margin? Something that we really cannot experience in a match, but but is um, is a factor. Closeness is a factor. Closeness and error reduction requires patience. We call it the difference between plumbing and Prepare, like preparing for battle. So there's between being a soldier and, uh, and a plumber. We're looking at, we're approaching it as if we need to plug the, stop the, stop the lead, like the plumber would do, the wrong that created the, you know, the dramatic winner. If we were to do that, then we really can, uh, we're in the right frame, strong frame, to approach this, this problem, this fundamental challenge of of unapprehendable margin. And we're continually fitting our game to that, to that margin, that closeness in the match the, that we can't appreciate whilst we're playing it. Or we can look at strong framing the problem and developing strong framing as a psychotechnology or part of the psychotechnology. It's part of the first strike games, Sterling's first strike games. And Sterling's momentum games, something we're going to look at more closely. How do we, how do we, how can we use momentum? How do we negotiate pressure? If we've got a plumber's mentality rather than the dramatic script that we carry around in our heads, this dramatic narrative and this perception based on current belief, and then we're going to stand a much better chance of addressing unapprehendable margin and reducing error. Always best to prepare for closeness in a match. So the next lecture we're going to have a, 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 a look and examination of some of the, the symptoms that players have with some of the symptoms that they display and the states they get themselves into. And we're going to look at that from the, you know, the, the, the cognitive perspective and how, how, how we can develop the psychotechnologies like competitive intelligence to deal with those problems. So, Thank you for watching.